This morning's reading comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. It's entitled, The Sheep and the Goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did you we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we seek when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do, for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The end. Amen. A woman by the name of Cynthia Manley realised she had only 20 minutes left to live. She figured the best thing she could do with that time uh, was to send messages to her daughters. So to one daughter she wrote, stay strong and no matter what happens, take care of you and your sister. Find a way to get to California to be together and be a family. I love you so much. To her other daughter, she wrote, no matter what happens, get your degree, have a good life and be successful and take care of your sister. Well, it turns out that Cynthia Manley actually had much more than 20 minutes left to live. You might recall back in 2018, uh, there was an incident where someone chose the wrong menu item on Hawaii's alert system and sent out an emergency alert to the whole of Hawaii uh, saying, Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek medical shelter. This is not a drill. And so for about half an hour, um, everybody there was convinced that they were about to die in a nuclear holocaust. I wonder what would you do if you have 20 minutes left to live? What would you say to people? And uh, we might all have what's all sorts of wonderful spiritual things we say we'd like to do, but I think this, this kind of thing is a great reminder. What would we really do? What is important to us in our life? One day we're going to stand before God and give an account for our life. Jesus told the parable uh, of a king with some servants. <clears throat> some of them were good, some of them were bad. To the good servants, he wrote, well done, good and faithful service. 
You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. You know, it's only by Jesus, faith, by faith in Jesus that we can get to heaven. But there are some things that we can do on earth that affect what we carry with us into heaven. Um, so, for instance, we can affect um, who we are in Christ, the glory that we bring to his name and the impact that we have on other people. Even though our life here is limited, we look forward to an ex eternal existence with God. So because God's glory endures forever, the glory that we bring him in this life will continue forever. Because we endure forever. Everything we do to grow and become more like Christ carries forward with us into heaven. And because the people around us are eternal, whenever we touch someone's life, that impact also carries forward into heaven. And so this morning, I'd like to just focus on the impact that we have in the lives of others. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote that we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Each of us will have to give an account uh, for all the good and bad we've done. And he concludes by saying, because of this, we try to persuade others. You know, what we do on earth doesn't get us into heaven, but it will go with us into heaven. Paul says that we need to try to persuade others because the people around us have an eternal existence and we want them to have an eternal existence in heaven with God too. And so there really is no better use of our time than to sh spend it sharing the gospel bringing others into a relationship with God. Now, I wish I could give you the perfect formula for persuading everyone to believe in Jesus. There are some great tools that can help us. Uh, things like the Alpha Course that we've done here at church, or pamphlets like the Roman Road or the Four Spiritual Laws. However, if just telling someone the Four Spiritual Laws would be enough to convert everyone, then our job would already be complete. The problem is that people are in all different places of walks in life. They're all different in terms of how close, how much they will accept the gospel. So I don't have a perfect formula that you can use to convert someone every time you speak to them. However, I do have a great place you can start. I want to give you just five words. They're very easy to remember words, and I believe they will really open doors with people. And they are, I notice you, you matter. I notice you, you matter. You see, you may not have the right answers for everyone. You may not have the most persuasive message or the world rocking testimony. But you can notice people and let them know that they matter to you. Almost everyone responds to being considered. Your efforts may or may not lead to their uh, conversion in an instant, but it is a really great place to start. When Jesus told this parable, uh, the king said, Come, you are blessed of my servant. Enter into your glorious inheritance. And that is a wonderful, wonderful promise. But there's a lot more to it that Jesus gets into. And a few verses down, we find the passage that Cynthia read to us. Uh, and he says how the, the servants who were given that wonderful promise said, But Lord, when did we see you a stranger and in need of clothing? When, when did we, we, we feed you when you were hungry? You know, we don't remember any of that. And Jesus said to them this, Whatever you do for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. See, on that day, we will care about how we treated others. We will care about how we touched their lives. But, you know, the great thing is that Jesus doesn't set the bar too high for us to achieve. It's not hard to make someone feel like they matter. See, a man was uh, walked into a bar. 
He sat down at the bar with his drink. There beside him was a bowl of peanuts. And as he's about to take his first sip, he heard a voice come from the bowl. I like your tie. Where did that come from? Oh, well. So he gets his drink. He's about to take a drink and he hears the voice from the bowl again. That's a really nice shirt. Am I hearing something? This is weird. You know? So for a third time, he's about to take his drink and he hears a voice from the bowl saying, you know, you're a really great guy. So he puts down his drink, calls over the bartender and says, um, Oi, what's the deal with these peanuts? And the bartender replies, Oh, they're complimentary. Jesus said, All you have to do is just give someone a cup of water. Just a cup of water counts. Jesus is saying that, you know, all we have to do is just get out of our own way and do anything to make someone feel special. You open the door for the guy in the wheelchair. That's great. That counts. You smiled at the grumpy lady next door with the yappy dog. That counts. You gave someone a compliment. That counts. Even a tiny compliment can have an eternal impact in someone's life. I like to think of um, the way we treat other people as being a bit like different levels of schooling. And uh, I, I don't know, this is not necessarily a, a huge biblical thing, um, but it is something that I like to use to help um, grow in my life in the way that I treat others. And so if, for instance, we, call, we, we look at the um, kindergarten level of kindness, the kindergarten level of kindness is, you know, just not shoving someone out of the way during a, a fire alarm or not always wanting to be the smartest and strongest person in every room. You know, most of us have graduated from kindergarten. Most of us can show that level of kindness to people. Uh, although I do sometimes wonder when I see the way people are out on the driving in the road on peak hour. But many people have gone beyond kindergarten and they're stuck at the primary school level. That's the kind of selflessness where you can let other people go before you. You can share with other people. Uh, when they're with you, you make an effort to put them first. But like a primary school kid, when they're out of sight, they're out of mind. And you just sort of forget about them. And many of us are stuck at that level and we need to graduate beyond that a little bit more. The high school level of selflessness is when people aren't with you and you still think about them. You still pray for them. You consider how you can be a blessing to them. And I believe this is the level of kindness that we're getting to where we're getting closer to God's ideal for his servant. But finally, we can graduate to the university level of kindness. You know, that's when we not only think about other people, but we're also prepared to sacrifice for them. We're prepared to Sex, sacrifice our own well-being or our own comfort or our own possessions in order to do something for someone else. You know, you've probably seen these people. They're the ones that are always there with a positive word of encouragement for others. They're the ones that are always taking in the waifs and strays into their home or the ones that just can't help but share the gospel with other people. You know, people who have moved to the next level. Of course, the the ultimate example of this uh, comes in Romans where we read that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, this is next level kindness. Reaching out to others begins with, I notice you, you matter. But it doesn't end there. So how do we move to the next step? How do we graduate beyond the kindergarten to the primary into the university level of kindness? And it's actually quite simple. Um, it's, it's actually not difficult to touch other people's lives. And it's found in a simple prayer. This is not a prayer you pray once and then you're done. This is a prayer that you need to pray all the time. 
A prayer that you pray every time you see someone in pain. A pray every time someone um, comes to your mind that you know is in need. A pray every time you want to make someone know that they matter. And it's a two-part word, and again, it's very simple. And it's simply this, Lord, what do they need? And Lord, what should I do? We're asking God, Lord, what do they need? And then we're saying, Lord, what can I do about it? We've all been in a situation where someone has, has lost a loved one. And so we might go up to them and say, oh, is there anything I can do to help? And usually the person doesn't really have a good answer for that question. And mostly they'll just say, oh, you can pray for me. <clears throat> now, maybe we do. Maybe we remember to pray for them. Maybe we remember to pray for them once or a couple of times during the week, but maybe not as often as we really should. And we haven't gone anything beyond that. And so the following week when we meet up with them, maybe it's a bit awkward because we realize, oh, I haven't really been praying for this person. You know, and we haven't done anything much. And we haven't really made an impact in their life. And so by praying this prayer, we can step forward into the next level. And so instead of asking them what they need, ask God, Lord, what do they need? And then say God puts into your mind, they need to know that they're not alone. So you say, okay, God, what should I do about that? And God puts into your mind, why not take them out for a coffee? That's pretty simple, isn't it? So instead of calling them and saying, hey, what do you need? You call them up and you say, let me take you out for coffee. Or let me take you out for lunch. Whatever it might be. And by doing that, you're showing next level kindness. Think of how our lives, our church and our community would change if we all made this a regular discipline where every day we pray for someone else? What if this prayer was as much a part of our everyday life as brushing our teeth? I mean, I'm assuming you brush your teeth every day. Um, just if we just did this every day. Now, you can't do this for everyone, I know. But you can do this for anyone. You know, when uh, James spoke about prayer, he used the example of Elijah who who prayed to stop the rain and the rain stopped. And he says this, he says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. This prayer is powerful and effective. This is a prayer that God can answer really quickly. Although sometimes he might ask us to persevere in praying for someone regularly over a longer period of time. But God does answer this prayer. It is a powerful prayer. It is an effective prayer. But also, got to warn you, it's a dangerous prayer. James also said, if anyone knows the good they ought to do but doesn't, it is a sin. You see, the danger in, in praying this prayer is that God will answer us and then we are required to follow through. We're required to do something about that. And when we do, we're moving to next level kindness. I wonder if you'll, uh, you'll join me where, as we come towards the conclusion of this series, the Easter challenge, we have just the one more week to go. And will you be challenged today to start just finding an opportunity each day where your words or your actions will say to somebody, I notice you and you matter. And then will you join me in praying for one another? And praying that prayer as a two-parter. Lord, what do they need? And Lord, what should I do about it? Will you commit to that? Can you take up that challenge? Know that God answers that prayer. You know, it's not, don't, don't worry, it's not like God is going to say to you, oh, you need to go out and buy this person a car. God is not going to, to tell us to do something that is beyond our means or beyond our ability to do. But God will bless this prayer. God will use us to touch the lives of others. And if we do this, 
you will be glad you did. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the kindness you've shown us. Thank you for our salvation. That even when we were sinners, you gave everything for us. Lord, I pray that you will help us to notice others because they matter to you and we want them to matter to us. Lord, remind us to seek your will and your strategies for them. Lord, challenge us by your spirit to pray for others. Lord, to pray for their needs and to pray for how we can be the vessel that meets those needs. Show us how we can make an influence and touch the lives of different people in so many ways, in every day. In Jesus' name, amen. As um, we conclude our, our service this morning, um, uh, just after the blessing, I'm going to leave you with a little video. Uh, it's uh, Keith Green, the gospel singer, and at one of his live con uh, con one of his live concerts, he shared this Bible passage that Cynthia read to us today, uh, the text about the sheep and the goats. Uh, it's a wonderful passage. Um, I warn you in advance, Keith Green died a, a long time ago. This was filmed back in the 70s. So the quality of the video is not very good. It's the best I could find. Um, but I've also added subtitles to it. Uh, and please just listen to the message. It's about eight minutes, I think it is. Uh, and it's a great way to finish the service. I'm, I'm sure you will uh, find this a real blessing. Um, so I look forward to hopefully catching up with you next week. Let's uh, conclude this part of our service with a blessing. Until we meet again, may the kindness of God precede you, may the wisdom of God be with you, and may the light of God follow you. Amen. Thanks for being with us online today. God bless you. It's just one of the middle ones. Just got two letters in it. I think I've discovered it as one of the most neglected, well, it's one of the most important neglected words today. There's a lot of words that are more important that we're not neglecting. But this word is real important, but we're neglecting it quite a bit. It's just a little word. It's the word, I'm not going to tell you. It's the word do. <laughs> and when the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit on his glorious throne and he shall divide the nations before him as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He shall put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And he shall say to those on his right, the sheep, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom before, prepared for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. Oh, I was sick, and you visited me. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Oh, I was in prison, and I waited for you, and you came to me. Thank you.
you hungry and we gave you something to eat? Or when were you thirsty and we gave you something to drink? Lord, I can't remember that. Uh, when were you naked and we clothed you? Lord, when were you a stranger and we invited you in? I mean, Lord, we invited lots of people in, but we can't remember seeing you there. Well, when were you sick or in prison and we visited you? I mean, we went to lots of prisons, Lord. We never saw you there. I mean, we knew you were there, but we never saw you. Lord, when? And as much as you've done it, to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. Oh, yes. And as much as you've done it, to the very least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. Enter into your rest. turn to those on his left, the goats. Depart from me, you cursed ones, and to everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked, and you never clothed me. I was a stranger, and I not, and I not, but you told me to go away. I was sick, and I was lying there in pain, and I waited for you, but you never came. I was in prison, and I rotted there, waiting for you. But I guess you had more important things to do. <laughs> Depart from me! You cursed ones. Lord, there must be some mistake. Lord, uh, when? Lord, when were you hungry or thirsty, Lord, and we didn't give you something? I mean, would you like something now? Why don't you angels go out and get the Lord a hamburger and a Coke or something? You don't hungry, Lord. Oh, oh Lord, uh, when were you naked and we didn't clothe you? I mean, I mean, we didn't even have your chest size, Lord. That's not fair. I mean, oh, Lord, this is something I got to know. When were you a stranger, Lord, and we didn't invite you in? I mean, we looked out the window every time, Lord. There were a lot of weirdos and creeps out there. Lord, that just wasn't our ministry, you know what I mean? You didn't want us to cast our pearls before swine, did you? Oh, now, come on, Lord. When were you sick? I mean, how could the Lord get sick? What did you have, anyway? Or in prison, I mean, you were in prison? What were you in for? done it to the least of my brethren you have not done it unto me 
That's all there is to it. And as much as you've not done it, to the very least of my brethren, you've not done it unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting fire. But the righteous into everlasting life. And my friends, the only difference between these two groups of people, according to these scriptures, is what they did and didn't do.